Brothers and sisters, we're very, very happy to be together. I am very happy to be together with you this morning. And we're going to be uh, meditating on the Word of God in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. You have it in your bulletins. And the companion for the journey, which as we heard last Sunday, is not, it ends up not being our journey, but God's journey with us and God's plan with us. Um, today is we're going to be thinking a little bit more closely about Paul. The topic that I put in the title, Beyond Theology, may or may not reflect fully what, uh, what I, I, some of the things that I see here and, and that I believe that are very important that Paul is trying to communicate to us. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 4 through 10, so that we would have a, a, a clearer idea. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if others think they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as a seal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider them for the sake of Christ, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I, cons I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I think that most of the ideas that we have gained about Paul uh, are related to his readings, or his writings rather, and we then read it, and it has been uh, a, a very common idea to call Paul the apostle of grace. And indeed, God's grace is present Every moment that uh, Paul is, is preaching, is teaching, is building a church, etc. So he is an incredible presenter and demonstrator, theologian of the grace of God, among many other things. But I think that it's crucial for us to understand Paul and his contribution to the church to know a little bit more about him before he had encountered Christ. What we encounter, what we see there, the man Saul of Tarsus is an incredible man, focused, committed, intelligent, brilliant mind. He is really charged for God. He wants to do things, and he is ready to put his life on the line if necessary. This man, with a great knowledge about God, he tells us, for example, that he was in regards to the law or the righteousness based on the law, faultless. What that means is that Paul understood 300 some precepts that were a no-no within the uh, Jewish traditions. And he also understood 200 some other precepts, commandments that he must obey. So this man had a list of all of those 500 some things. And if he had a check mark, he was faultless. It's incredible in many ways. However, that having said that, we also find in the, once he starts persecuting the church, we find a very incredible, ruthless, cruel uh, man, a killer, torturer. We find someone extremely full of anger. We find someone who was after these this people from the way, that was the sect, how they used to call the initial Christians, and he was out there to destroy them. And during the whole time, wholeheartedly believing that he was obeying God. Some of our worst terrorists of our days, or worst cartel killers, would see eye to eye with Paul. They would be kind of the same person. That's the amazing thing. That God's grace comes to the life of a man 
who can be the worst in many, many ways and transforms him and changes him. And that's the point where I would like to present the term theology, not as an academic discipline, which we are in desperate need of. Solid teaching is a great need of our days. In the midst of all kinds of confusion and all kinds of different ways of thinking and mixing and matching and eclectic confusion, I call it, we need solid ground, theological. And we are so grateful to great theologians. But that is not the theological, not, is not the way I would like to use the theology today. Just for today, if you can bear with me, I would like to suggest the theological stage as cutting the word theos and logos from the Greek. Theos, referring to God. Logos, referring to words, study, or something, some kind of knowledge, awareness, cognitive awareness about something. So, biology, bios and logos, the study of life, geography, study of the earth, etc. In that sense, there seemed to be an area that Paul and some other Christians, and the danger for today as well, that we come to know God at a cognitive level, a stage that we are comfortable when we talk about it, when we reason, when we do some research. However, we do not go beyond that. And that's why I present Paul as someone who is in his life. There came a time when he went beyond theology. He was a great theologian. And I, I already defended the point that we need to and we must and we're grateful to great theologians of all the centuries. However, some of the characteristics if we come to this stage of just staying in the under lo, uh, theos logos, that's one area of living, if we come to this lifestyle of just staying there, there are at least three characteristics of this way of living. One, it's comfortable. You can study, you can discuss, you agree, you choose options, and they say, well, this theologian, uh, I understand things this way, I like it, but this other one I prefer. So that's, that's comfortable in that sense. But the second thing, if you evaluate verses 4 through 6, is that this kind of lifestyle, if we want to call it that way, is also the language that is used is very characteristics. I, me, and mine. I like it, I don't like it, I go, I do, I, I, we, 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 I can do this, etc., etc. That's what Paul is saying. I am Jew of Jews, I do this, I, did, I, I am able to do that. My people, me, my, and I. Compare that afterwards. It's completely different. It's not focused anymore in I and me and mine, or what I can do. But it's focused completely on who God is, what God has done. His power, His love, His grace, His plan. So the second characteristic of this theology or theos logos realm is that is the language is I can do this, that, me and mine. The third and most vicious piece of this kind of lifestyle, and remember that we're talking about in a, a man incredibly religious. Whatever your exercises, the spiritual religion, exercises are, or mine, they pale in comparison with Paul's zeal and religious ability. But the third characteristic of living under Theos Logos lifestyle is that the self is in control. Now what does that mean? Is that the self is willing to move away a little bit, to give in, to bend, but ultimately remains in power, is the one that decides everything and anything. It's similar to the, uh, the government that we find in Great Britain. They do have a king, but king 
has zero power authority to make any big decisions. The decision maker is not the king. It's talk about it and everything else. However, the prime minister, ah, that's where the power is. So in this lifestyle, when I'm saying that the self is in control, we as, as a community, Paul or many other ones, might talk about a king, sing about a king, pray to a king. Nevertheless, when the time comes to make decisions, it's not King Jesus who makes the decisions, but is first minister, I and me, the self. All of these things, all of this lifestyle, as incredible as it was, comes to the point in the life of Paul where he discovers and displays his credentials. But then he says, all of that is nothing. All of that I consider complete loss. It's garbage. Now, we're not saying that it's useless completely. But he's comparing two things. And what he's saying is, if I compare all of these things that I have done, all these Theos Logos lifestyle, all of my techniques and all my um, religious activity exercises, and then I compare that with the incredible, imminent knowledge of God, experiencing his power, then all of these previous things is nothing. It's worthless. It's garbage. It's complete loss. Brothers and sisters, what we're talking about here is that this man, at that time he was considered to be a, a, a someone contemporary of Jesus. The, the, uh, the letter of Philippians was written roughly in the fifth year 56. Paul at that time had had already the chance to go through many different experiences. Had been building churches, preaching in jail, had been doing all kinds of things, seen miracles, received revelations, planted churches, taken to the third heaven in the spirit, put in jail, stoned, with 117 stripes on his back that had been whipped by the Jews, he says, three times. And they used to apply 39 times. They were concerned that if they would apply longer, you would die. So the man, this is the man we're talking about. And at that point, he says that all of that is nothing for the imminent knowledge of Christ. This man has moved from Theos Logos to Theos Kratos. Kratos meaning power. That's where we take our word democracy. The mos and kratos. Kratos power, the mos, the people. Democracy is the power of the people. In this case, Paul had moved his life from this previous lifestyle to coming before God. What happened there is that, point one, there, Paul's rebel soul. He was a rebel. He was a hunter, a killer, torturer. And, and I want to, you to see that. Because what that means, brother and sister, is that regardless of who you are, regardless of what you have done, regardless of where you or what has been done to you, God's grace is greater. God's grace is there to take you and transform you and forgive you the same as he has done to each of, of us here. Paul's rebel soul was captured, transformed. All of his goals, values, dreams, expectations, everything was changed. Everything was surrendered. The second thing that we find in this kind of lifestyle living under the power of God, is that Paul submits. He's not in charge. He's not the big man calling the shots. He's not ordering around people. He's not, not doing nothing of that. What he's doing is following orders. He's obeying humbly. He's suffering. The third thing that we can see in Paul's life is that he becomes, gladly becomes, a douloi. A servant, bond servant, 
Duloy was this image of a slave, and that's what it means. The language starts and is centered in God. Verses 8 through 10, the whole thing is completely different in Paul. I would like to share with you in closing four specific areas that Paul focuses on as, he, as we explore this incredible change from one Theos Logos lifestyle to one Theos Kratos under the power of God. Number one, his goal is to gain Christ. Not his blessings, not his gifts. Paul does not approach God with a list of things. Hey, God, I'm going to do this, this, this. Would you mind just signing it here? You know, just, just, just give me the approval, would you? I, I need this thing and I need another something, this, that. It's not after that. Sadly, many times that's the case. That's how we approach God. Paul is coming after God. He's hungry after God himself. Doesn't want blessings, gifts, nothing. Wants God. He's hungry for God. The second thing that Paul wants is to be found in Christ. And by that he means, I do not want to be trusting, depending on anything. Any theological awareness, any uh, spiritual exercises, any religious accomplishments. No. The only thing I can be standing on is God's grace. Found in Christ, incorporated, based on him, standing on him. Not in my own righteousness or legal rectitude. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the most insidious things to get rid of in our lives and in the Christian church today, as this has been throughout history. We all have the tendency that if you have done something for God, something great, good, wonderful, then you feel like you are kind of closer to God. You're more acceptable. But boy, if you have seen or failed, or if you do not come to church one day, Ooh, like uh, something is wrong. Brothers and sisters, the freedom, the incredible freedom that we have in Christ is that He is our righteousness. He is the one that has delivered us from all of these rules and regulations. And He has come to embrace us through His grace. The third thing that Paul is focusing on he wants to experience the power of the resurrection. What an incredible thing to say. What a daring thing to say. But that's what Paul is after. It's not after a nice, comfortable lifestyle. It's not after an independent, selfish, motivated way of doing things. He wants to experience God's power. Nothing else. Period. God himself is standing in him and he wants to experience God's power. The power of the resurrection. The same power that has moved Jesus Christ from being dead to being alive. The same power. That's what he's after. He wants to see God in action. This goes beyond theology. It's not a cognitive awareness of God. It's not an academic exercise. All those that went to Campbell Hope. Whatever you experienced there. What was it? Why? Because of cognitive awareness, knowledge, a theological understanding of something, a deep discussion on a philosophical whatever else? No. You were there and whatever you experienced, you experienced God's power. Moving, transforming, touching your life. Seeing poverty, but seeing also people moving forward, hungry for God. Your own self. That's what Paul is after. The power of God. Experiencing power of God. And finally, becoming similar to Christ, even to the point of his death. What that means 
is that the eternal question of human suffering finally has an answer. Sharing Christ's sufferings means suffering for the same things that Christ suffer. Crying for the same things that Christ cries. Touching the heart of God. And, and finding out what is there that moves God's heart. And then you synchronize with that and you start feeling the anguish, the pain of seeing a world that is lost. That's the motivation for thousands of missionaries throughout history of moving, abandoning everything, their careers, their money, their everything. And moving, being willing to be sacrificed, being willing to be unknowns, because they want to participate in the sufferings of Christ, including his death. But also means understanding our own suffering in the light of eternity. In this world, we're here and we all suffer. How do you experience that? How do you interpret that? What do you do with it? What Paul discovered is that any kind and every kind of suffering, he can take it to the cross and he can put it in Christ's hands. And then, because of his power, he transforms and heals and touches our lives and our, in every area that we need. Brothers and sisters, those are some of the things that we can learn from Paul. Some of the conclusions would be one conclusion, very simple. Are you ready? Do you want to experience the power of the resurrection in your life? What's the area or areas of your life where you need to discover and to actually experience an encounter with God? In that specific area that you need healing, that you need a strength, maybe learn to forgive someone that for years has not been, you have not been able to forgive. Maybe you need to surrender your life. Maybe thus far you have been learning and you're willing and you give in and you bend a little bit, but you ultimately continue in the throne of your own life. The world is waiting for a revival. And that revival has to start with you and me today. Let us bow our heads and pray. Lord God, we come before you asking you to reveal in the depths of our soul our mind, our heart. We pray that by the power of your Spirit you would move in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would find in us hearts that would move to the guidance in accordance with your Spirit. Lord, I pray that it would move in my life, in my heart, in many areas that need to experience your power, the power of the resurrection. I pray that it would guide each of my brothers and sisters to be hungry after you. Not religious activities, empty exercises, even if they are great, but that we would learn to see you. We want to be found in you. We want to experience even your sufferings. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.